And good morning. Welcome to this service at New Life Church in Toulon, Manitoba. My name is Henry Ozerny, and I'm the interim pastor here at New Life. We introduced the service with that song, Mary Had a Little Lamb, and I was telling our young teenage technological genius uh, who does all the taping for us here, uh, Key, and I said, I played that for you because I know that's your favorite song. I don't think he was too pleased to hear that. Anyways, uh, see the picture on the screen of our church and... Uh, here in Toulon, we had a nice snowfall, and uh, one of the ladies in our church took this picture of our church a couple of days ago, and we have a white Christmas for us here at New Life. Well, as we begin our service this morning, we're still carrying on the theme of Christmas. It's only a couple of days after Christmas, and a wonderful song entitled Joy to the World, and uh, Phil Wickham sings it, uh, Enjoy the Music of the Season.
Our scripture reading this morning is from uh, Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. And we have a little bit of a unique scripture reading. Came across an interesting, uh, someone actually sent this to me uh, on Facebook. Um, a uh, uh, little four-year-old boy by the name of David, son of Becky and Ryan DeFigurado. De um, this uh, little boy uh, memorized, uh, let me read what the mother writes about him. When a friend asked David to narrate the live nativity, I asked him to read these verses twice in the morning and twice at night. A few weeks later, I realized he no longer needed the paper. Starting and ending our day with this beautiful story has brought the spirit of Christmas into our home and reminded us of the true meaning of Christmas. So here is uh, David Figueredo and the Christmas story. Go. Luke 2, 6 through 16. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swelling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And below the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swelling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. And it came wait. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I know that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem a long time ago. He set an example for us throughout his life. He atoned for our sins. He was crucified on the cross, and then he was resurrected. He came for me, and he came for you. Because he came, I can return to my lovely home. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I think uh, little David uh, uh, DeFigurado did a great job there re uh, reciting the Christmas story. And so this morning, let's uh, bow as we pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he came into this world. <clears throat> as the scripture says, to atone for our sins. We thank you because of his coming as the Lamb of God that we are now able to have the forgiveness of all of our sins and receive the gift of eternal life. We are so thankful for that. And so we commit this service to you. We pray your blessing upon it. May everything that is said and done bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue on with a few announcements, and uh, as has been over the past several weeks, we are still under Code Red. I think the government here in Manitoba has said that January the 8th they will be revisiting this, but uh, we will not be meeting for services or Bible studies until, of course, that is lifted. So keep on praying for that in the meantime. A couple of uh, videos that I've made that you might be interested in watching. It's on our church uh, YouTube channel as well as, well as my, own, my own channel, Pastor Henry Ozerny. Uh, should Christians wear masks and should churches stay open during the coronavirus pandemic? 
If those are questions that are uh, topics of conversation around your kitchen table, you might be interested in watching both of those. And to all the folks of our congregation, we encourage you to send in your tithes and offerings before year-end because uh, following December 31st, uh, we are no longer able to give tax-deductible receipts, so keep that in mind. We have another song by Amy Grant entitled, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of Well, this is the first Sunday after Christmas, and I trust that you've had a wonderful time, uh, even if, just like uh, my wife and I, uh, we were unable to share it with our family. I came across this cute little picture of a bear who says, I'm happy to spend Christmas alone, and yet you see uh, the face there, not too terribly happy. I was going through some old pictures of ours, and this was Christmas 2019 in our family. Uh, my wife, Linda, opening up one of her presents, and then uh, uh, here's me with my son-in-law comparing the uh, similar gifts we received, the uh, coffee thermoses. Mine was a little bit bigger than my son-in-law's, and he was not too happy about that, but uh, we had a great time last year. Well, this was our Christmas this year. Uh, we ate our meal together, Linda and I, and this is a picture of us enjoying our dessert, a Saskatoon pie with a generous heap helping of ice cream on it. And for a Christmas present, I uh, got a very interesting one from my kids. And you see here the t-shirt and it says, I'll blow it up so you can see a little closer. Pastor, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. So I think my uh, wife and my kids uh, have probably suffered under that for many a year. And I think this was a little bit of a revenge and I was forced to wear it all day on Christmas Day. I heard about a little boy who uh, 
an uncle had given him a harmonica, and the uncle asked him, he said, how did you like the harmonica I gave you for Christmas? And he said to his uncle, man, it's the best present I ever got. Well, the uh, uncle said, uh, that's great. Have you learned how to play it? No, he said, I don't play it at all, the little boy said. He said, you see, my mom gives me a dollar not to play it during the daytime, and my dad gives me five dollars a week not to play it in the evening. Um, a lot of other Christmas stories. I heard about a little three-year-old girl when she opened up her Christmas present and she looked at the toy and she yelled aloud to the rest of the family, um, this is my best Christmas present. This is what I've always wanted since I was a little girl. And then uh, there's a grandma who, when she reached the age of 90, I heard about, uh, she was asked by her granddaughter what she wanted for Christmas and the grandmother said to her granddaughter, just give me a kiss. And she said, then I won't have to dust it. But when our children were small, we taught them all the typical nursery rhymes, like Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and, and Jill came and broke his crown. Oh, all right, I made a mistake. That's why my kids didn't sing it properly all through the years. And uh, a number of others, uh, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. And Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean. But between the two of them, they licked the platter clean. Well, one of the, our kids' favorites was, of course, the uh, nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Here it goes. Well, that uh, little nursery rhyme has been the basis of a very, very profound song. And it's sung here, it's entitled Mary Had a Little Lamb, sung here by Sharon uh, Moore Caldwell. And uh, I want you to listen to it. It's a great song.
Well, this morning I'm going to talk about Mary's little lamb. And before we do, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, look back at the birth of Jesus and in a particularly unique way as he came to this world as the Lamb of God. And we pray that as we understand this biblical truth that our hearts would be drawn closer to you and that uh, particularly the purpose for which he came, which was to pay the price of our sins, to pay the penalty of our sins, and to, for us to be forgiven, may be uh, that the thought that uh, most dominates our minds this morning. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And this morning I stand against all the forces of darkness to command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. Holy Spirit, I welcome you here. Guide and lead us into the truth. In your name we pray. Amen. It's interesting to notice that sheep are involved in the Christmas story. You see in the picture on the screen the uh, shepherd's field as it's taken today uh, <clears throat> from shepherd's field. And in the background you can see the modern day city of uh, Bethlehem. Uh, Linda and I first visited uh, Shepherd's Field in our first trip to Israel back in 1986, and you could see us standing uh, there at that time. Well, it was there in Shepherd's Field that the angels appeared to the shepherds uh, who were watching over their flocks and said to them, Fear not, I, uh, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And we're all acquainted with that story. But here's a question I want to ask you, and that is this. Have you ever wondered why it was that the angels appeared to the shepherds to inform them of the birth of Jesus? Why did they go to the shepherds? Like, what was the reason for uh, them uh, telling the shepherds this? Uh, when you think about it, really, that would be almost, in my opinion, almost the last place you would have uh, thought the angels would go. Uh, you would think that such a marvelous announcement would be made in Jerusalem, perhaps in the temple where thousands of worshipers would be coming in and coming into the temple. And that's where the angels would have gone and said, behold, I bring you good news uh, of great joy. Um, or, you know, even other, why not to the farmers or construction workers or fishermen or potters, whatever, or, or even why not to golfers? I'm, I'm sure there must have been a golf course in Bethlehem. Why not to the golfers? Why to the shepherds? What was the reason behind that? Why did the angels come to the shepherds? Well, if you do a little bit of a deeper research into the Bible, you'll find out that the place where the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks, there was a name to it. It was called Migdal Eder. Migdal Eder. And uh, <clears throat> translated into English, Tower of the Flock. Micah chapter 4, verse 8 talks about it in this way. For as for you, O watchtower of the flock, Migdal Eder, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to the daughter of Jerusalem. And again, another prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, and Jesus was his name. Now, the location Migdal Eder is actually referred to in uh, Genesis. Specifically, it's in the story of the death and burial of Jacob's wife, Rachel. We read in Genesis 35, 19, uh, and this is after Jacob was coming back from Padan Aram, where uh, he had been for the past 20 years, and he was coming back to Israel, uh, to the Promised Land. And it says, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. The word Ephrath uh, uh, and Bethlehem are synonymous. And over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. So the day that the book of Genesis was being written, there was still this pillar standing there indicating uh, Rachel's tomb. And then it goes on to say in Genesis 35, verse 21, And Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. And uh, the burial place for Rachel was near Bethlehem, where Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock, was located. And here's a picture of a map. And you see at the bottom of the screen in the black font, you can see below the arrow I put in there, Bethlehem. And right above Bethlehem, the round red circle with the red font, Migdal Eder. And if you go straight north, follow that dotted line, which is the road, you come to Jerusalem. And uh, Bethlehem uh, was and is about five miles south of Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, talking about the uh, uh, Migdal Eder and uh, the, uh, the tower there, one of the things that shepherds did in biblical times uh, 
was to build a tower from which they were able to keep an eye on their sheep. For example, in the uh, parable that Isaiah gives in Isaiah chapter 5, it goes like this. And this is the, is, Isaiah puts it as uh, God speaking this parable. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Now, I've had the opportunity to visit Nazareth Village in Nazareth, um, a little uh, reconstruction of the ancient uh, village of Nazareth, a wonderful place to visit. And they have there a shepherd's tower. You see the picture there on the screen. And it was from that kind of a tower that shepherds would keep watch over their flocks. They were looking out for predators, uh, uh, wolves that might be coming uh, around, um, as well as, of course, for thieves and robbers. Well, biblical scholars believe that the shepherds to whom the angels came were at Migdal Eder. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the interesting thing is this, that the shepherds who watched over the flocks at Migdal Eder were not ordinary shepherds. Uh, and that's because of the unique purpose that Migdal Eder served. It was the place where sheep that were destined to be sacrificed in the temple at Jerusalem were being raised. Now, in biblical times, the lambs that were used for the sacrifices in, or lambs were used for the sacrifices in the temple. For example, here's a verse uh, that I've chosen kind of uh, out of many I could have selected, Numbers 28, says there, and this is the offering made by fire you are to present to the Lord. Two lambs a year old without defect as a regular burnt offering each day. Prepare one lamb in the morning and one in the, uh, uh, and the other at twilight. So two lambs every day were offered up on the altar, the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Um, and if you tally that up, there was over the course of a year, there was uh, 1,068 lambs who were offered up in sacrifice for the various sacrifices. Now, in the Bible, lambs played a very significant uh, role. And specifically, they were used, uh, as I've already said, for the sacrifices. So here's what, how it worked. Say uh, if a man committed a sin and he did something that he, was, he knew was wrong, was convicted of it, that he had transgressed uh, God's holy law, he would go to his flock and pick out a year-old lamb. He would pick one that had was perfect without spot or blemish. It would be the best of his uh, flock. And then he would take it to Jerusalem to the temple. There at the temple, he would give it to the priest and the priest in turn would take that lamb and offer it as a sacrifice on the altar. It'd be a burnt offering. And so what you really had was this, people sinned and innocent, helpless, unresisting lambs paid the price. So these lambs were a very crucial part of Isra Israelite daily spiritual life. Now we know that these lambs were raised near Bethlehem, and that's because in the Jewish writings that we call the Talmud, a collection of uh, writings that they put together, it specified specifically that these lambs were to be born and raised within five miles of Jerusalem, and that's exactly the distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, as I said, even to this day, obviously. And so, in all likelihood, it was at Migdal Eder, that the, t the Tower of the Flock, where these lambs were born. And there, <clears throat> they, they would have shepherds who were trained and employed uh, in Levitical regulations, all the rules that the law carried, especially in the book of Levi, and the temple priests in Jerusalem would be the ones who would regulate that. And these shepherds would then keep watch over the sacrificial flock. They would do it day and night from the upper story vantage of the agricultural watchtower. Now, I think there's a very interesting uh, thing that uh, I should mention in this regard, uh, and that is uh, how these sheep were specifically born and cared for. You see, when a sheep was almost ready to give birth, she was brought into the protective lower level of the migdal, uh, the tower, in the shepherd's field. Now, the migdal there at migdal Eder was used for this purpose. It was not a stable for donkeys, chickens, and cows because it was specifically used for 
the sheltering of lambs consecrated for the holy use of sacrifices. And so when a lamb was born, these shepherds had the responsibility to inspect all of these newly born lambs to see if there was any defect in it. And if they found that a lamb was perfect without spot or blemish, it would then be set aside to be used for the sacrifices in the temple. And it received special care. And the special care these lambs received was this. They were then taken and wrapped in tightly in swaddling cloths. Uh, it's interesting, I came across a story or a, a, a picture online of a, a woman who says she still raises uh, sheep, uh, raises sheep today. And uh, this was her Twitter note. She's put it, uh, and it was online, loving this new lamb wrap from horseware. Uh, it wraps around the lamb and uses Velcro to fasten, keeping both lamb contained and warm. And then she concludes by saying, cheers, guys. Well, you see here, this lamb is then wrapped up in this special um, uh, uh, covering for it. And um, it's interesting, in that same Twitter feed, you, you'll uh, notice below, I noticed this statement one of her friends responded, said, and you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Well, that's what they did in biblical times. And so that lamb was wrapped in, in swaddling clothes and then laid in the close protection of a manger, a feeding trough hewn from stone. Um, the uh, typical picture we have of uh, the manger was uh, made of wood, uh, you know, with cross legs, and that's typically what we, we see. But really, in uh, biblical times, that was not what they used. Uh, when I was uh, on one of my first trips to Israel, my son Curtis was with me, and we went uh, to a uh, site um, called Megiddo, and our tour guide there, Ezekiel, or uh, nicknamed Hezi, I had my son Curtis, who was the shortest in the entire group that we had that, on that trip, he said, I want you to come and lay in here. And the picture that uh, uh, Ezekiel pointed out, our tour guide, was that this was where the lambs would have been put um, there, and they would stay uh, to keep them from bumps, bruises, uh, broken bones, and blemishes and, and, uh, there in that manger. Well, then when the sheep was a year old, they were taken to the temple in Jerusalem where they would be used for the sacrifice for the sins of the people. Well, with that background relating to how Migdal Eder was the place where these lambs were shared, I want to switch now to look at the Lamb of God. And uh, the question I want to begin by asking is, uh, why would I refer to baby Jesus as we've uh, listened to uh, the song already, Mary's Little Lamb? Uh, why, why do I call Jesus a lamb? And of course, I think you already know the answer is because in the Bible, Jesus is called a lamb more than once. For example, uh, it's one of the titles that is given to Jesus. He's the lamb of God. You see here this uh, picture of a church um, uh, a window here with the uh, lamb and below it, it says uh, Jesus, lamb of God. Actually, the title Lamb of God was first given to Jesus by his cousin, John the Baptist. In John 1, 29, as John was baptizing, we read it, Jesus came walking by the Jordan River, and John pointed to the people gathered around and said, Behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that title was given to Jesus by John. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is referred to as a lamb a total of 24 times. For example, here's what it says in Revelation 5, 11 and 12. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And here Jesus is called the Lamb, and they are worshiping and praising him as he's sitting there on the throne in heaven. So back to the first question I was asking earlier on. So why did the shepherds appear to a uh, why did the angels appear to a bunch of shepherds 
in the field near Bethlehem? And the answer, of course, is that it was there in Bethlehem that Mary's little lamb had just been born. And I want you to notice what the angels said about this little lamb. They called him the Savior, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which indicates his purpose for coming into the world. Uh, he is a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and the Messiah, who would be the one who would rule over all, was primarily coming as a Savior. And so, as the story tells us, the shepherds made haste to go to Bethlehem to see Mary's little lamb. And when they got there, they realized the significance of this little lamb in the manger. Now, I, you see here, I've drawn the cartoon very incorrectly, according to what I was saying before earlier when I was referring how we typically draw mangers. Um, and anyways, I'll have to redraw that cartoon for future uses in, in the future. Anyways, my point is this, that the shepherds then realized that this particular baby, this lamb, was destined to die once for all for the sins of all humankind. And this is what the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once for all. And the implication to these particular shepherds was significant because they were the ones God wanted first to know that because of Jesus' final lasting sacrifice, or sins, there would be no more temple sacrifices. Well, I guess this is essentially God giving them a pink slip, and I'm sure he provided them with very good alternate employment afterwards. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hebrews 10, 18, and where these have been forgiven, talking about the forgiveness through Jesus, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. We don't go and take a lamb today and offer it uh, as a sacrifice. I'm sure Peter's um, uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals are quite happy with that uh, new covenant ruling. We don't sacrifice lambs for our sins anymore because we have the final fulfilled sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Well, we all know the rest of the story. This lamb ended up growing up in Nazareth with his parents, Mary and Joseph. We read in Luke 2 after uh, he uh, was born. It said, and when Mary and Joseph had done everything required by the law of the Lord, you remember they'd uh, gone to the temple and uh, such. Then they had spent some time in Egypt. They returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. And he ended up taking up his father's trade as, as a young man. Now uh, we read this in Mark 6 that they referred, the people around him referred, isn't this the carpenter? And notice they Call him by his trade. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? So he had at least four half-brothers and at least a minimum of two sisters, uh, possibly more, that um, were half-brothers, half-sisters to him. And then, of course, at the age of 33, uh, without any sin or blemish himself, he became the supreme sacrifice for the sins of the world. When he died on the cross at Calvary, Jesus had no sin in him. Uh, first, Second Corinthians uh, 5, uh, uh, 14 says, In him was no sin. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised, crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And so Jesus thus became the Lamb of God who takes away, as John said, the sins of the world in John 1, 29. Hebrews 9, 28, Christ died only once as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Hebrews 10, 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the way of, uh, empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. And notice how it describes Christ here, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was the sinless, perfect Son of God. Well, I want to talk about our response to this lamb. And I want to say that that's why every Christmas. I'm so thankful for Mary's lamb. 
And the reason is because, of course, that Jesus died so that none of us would have to pay the penalty of our sin, being separated from God forever and ever. You see, every time I sin, and I only have to commit one sin to be a sinner, uh, <clears throat> James chapter 2 says that whoever breaks one point of the law is guilty of breaking all of them, and it only takes one sin to make you a sinner. That sin then becomes a barrier between me and God. It separates me from God, and I have to pay the penalty of sin. And that's why in Romans 6.23 it says the wages of sin is death. And the point of that is, is that either I die for my sin or I get a substitute, someone else to die for me in my place. And that's, of course, where Jesus comes in. And because he died for us, the, the rest of that verse in Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't do anything to deserve it. We simply receive it as a gift. Because we've sinned, we deserve the condemnation and the judgment of God. One sin is enough to send me to hell. And sin creates, when we sin, it creates within us a problem of guilt. And maybe this morning you are struggling with guilt in your life over the things that you've done that you know are wrong. And in the quietness of your heart, you would have to admit, yes, I know I've sinned. Nobody's lived a perfect life. Nobody bats a thousand. Everybody fails in some way or another. Uh, ever, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, all of us have an inbuilt moral code that we know we have violated it. Uh, it's this conscience that points out we've done something wrong. We know we have uh, transgressed the great command of God. I know some people try to ignore it. I remember... Uh, seeing a bumper sticker somebody had put on their car, screw guilt. Well, you can say that, but it doesn't work. You can't. It's there all the time. I was reading a blog by a fellow uh, who made this comment. He said, there is no such thing as sin. It's all an illusion. You do your best for yourself and others and forget the past because nobody's keeping track. Well, that's not true. God is keeping track. Um, the Bible calls it the book of works. God is keeping tracks of everything, track of everything we do. And then the guy says, if, and if they are, they're sad. Well, uh, God has the right to keep track because he created us and has the right to call for us to respond in a life of, of holiness and purity. Now, if people are really honest, they would have to admit that the guilt of their sin haunts them. I read an interesting uh, uh, article some time ago uh, quoting a statement made by a woman who called herself Hitler's last secretary, Trudy Young. Uh, and the book she entitles, Until the Final Hour. And she tells of her experience of becoming Hitler's secretary. And she puts a very interesting statement uh, in the book, which she says, and I quote, When I was 22 and eager for adventure, I was fascinated by Adolf Hitler. And I deliberately ignored the warning voice inside of me, though I heard it clearly enough. I have learned to admit that I enjoyed working for him almost to the bitter end. And after the revelation of his crimes, I shall always live with the sense that I must share the guilt. What a tragic, tragic story that is. Uh, living with the guilt. And notice how she puts it. I ignored the warning voice inside of me. We always get that voice saying, don't do that. You know it's wrong. You shouldn't do it. In an interesting book entitled The Sunflower, Simon Weisenthal tells the story of an experience that he had. He was a young Polish Jew, uh, a Polish of, uh, a man of Jewish background, and he was in a Nazi concentration camp. And the story goes that uh, one day a nurse approached him at uh, the concentration camp uh, where he was, and she asked him, are you a Jew? And he nodded yes, and uh, she signaled for him to accompany her. And Weisenthal, it says this, Follow, Weisenthal followed her to the hospital room, where a soldier lay swathed in bandages. The wounded man was an SS officer, and he had summoned Weisenthal for a deathbed confession. My name is Carl. I must tell you of this horrible deed, be tell you because you are a Jew. In a town abandoned by retreating Russians, Carl's unit had stumbled onto booby traps that killed 30 of their soldiers. As an act of revenge, the SS rounded up 300 Jews, herded them into a three-story house, doused it with gasoline, and, hired, and fired grenades at it. Carl and his men encircled the house, their guns drawn to shoot anyone who tried to escape. The screams from the house were horrible, he said, reliving the moment. I saw a man with a young 
and a small child in his arms. Her clothes were alight. Beside him stood a woman, doubtless the mother of the child. With his free hand, the man covered the child's eyes. Then he jumped into the street. Seconds later, the mother followed. From the other windows fell burning bodies, and we shot. Oh, God, said the man in the bed. All this time, Simon Weisenthal sat in silence, letting the German speak, soldier speak. Carl went on to describe other atrocities, but he kept circling back to the scene of that young boy with black hair and dark eyes falling from a building, target practice for the SS rifles. I am left here with my guilt, he concluded at last. And in the last hours of my life, you were with me. I do not know who you are. I only know that you are a Jew, and that is enough. I know that what I have told you is terrible. And in the long nights while I have been waiting for death, time and time again, I have longed to talk about it with a Jew and to beg forgiveness from him. Only I didn't know, know if whether there were any Jews left. I know what I am asking is almost too much for you. But without your answer, I cannot die in peace. And then the article concludes in this way. Weisenthal looked at the, heapless, uh, at the eyeless heap of bandages lying on the bed. At last I made up my mind, Weisenthal writes, and without a word, I left the room. I mean, I know I've used a couple of extreme examples, but it illustrates the reality of guilt for sin. Now, here's my point. Though people like Simon Weisenthal may not forgive you for the terrible things you may have done to them, I'll tell you this, God will. That's the good news of Christmas. You see, by Jesus' death on Calvary's cross, it makes it possible for God to forgive us of all of our sins. Revelation. 7, 13, and 14. Then one of the elders asked me, These in red robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The red blood of Jesus takes dirty, sinful, blackened hearts and makes them white. I came across an interesting picture some time ago, of a what is called a decellular, decellularized heart. And they say, uh, scientists uh, use this as a, what they call a scaffold to grow a new heart uh, using stem cells. Amazing some of the um, medical uh, procedures that are uh, being done uh, in this day and age. But as I looked at that picture, I thought it's a, a, in a spiritual sense, it's a wonderful illustration of how our hearts so full of sin can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And that's why in 1 John 1, 7, it says, In the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. And all we have to do is, you know, is come to him and ask for his forgiveness. Admit that you are a sinner and ask him to forgive you. As uh, uh, Peter, the apostle, was speaking to the crowds on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 38, and he said to them, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified. He accused them of putting to death the Messiah. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then he goes on, and the people respond by saying, Brothers, what shall we say? And Peter goes on to say, Repent and be baptized. And every one of you, uh, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Told them to repent and to follow that repentance by taking the act of being baptized. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all we have to do. We have to come and ask for forgiveness. Came across an interesting testimony by a man by the name of Mike Da Silva. And he puts it this way I was born in Canada to immigrant parents. They both worked at multiple jobs, so I grew up going to and coming from school to an empty house. My parents taught us to be religious and to try to be the best you can, otherwise God may punish you. Everything started changing when I reached my adolescent years. I began to experiment with many different things, primarily drugs and alcohol. And by the time I reached 16 years of age, I experienced a drug overdose. I got myself involved in so many other things which I'm ashamed of and will not bother to write out. 
Within two years, I was married, and everything seemed perfect for a while. My wife and I were both working. We had a place of our own, and within four years, we had two healthy baby boys. Unfortunately, I began to dabble in the things that almost destroyed me. During this time, my wife had a friend who would constantly invite us to come and hear someone speak at her church. At first, I was definitely not interested, but she was kind to my wife and children, so I decided to go to one service. Only as a favor, of course. And this is where I'd like to tell you that what I heard that night, which changed my life forever. The message was a story of God and his love for all mankind. The speaker was at the door, shaking everyone's hand and thanking them for coming. I actually tried to avoid him, but he caught my attention, shook my hand, and asked me if I was saved. I told him I didn't understand what he meant, so he put it this way. If you should get into a car accident tonight and were under ushered into eternity, where will your soul be, in heaven or hell? With all my religious upbringing, I told him, I'll go wherever God wants me to go. Well, he told me that God's great message is that you will be saved through the finished work of Christ. He further asked me if I believed I was a sinner, and I had no problem admitting that. Then he told me where unforgiving sinners go if they should die in their sins. But God didn't want any soul to go there, and so he has made provision for anyone who would change their way of thinking and simply believe him. Well, that night we read a few scripture verses, John 3, 16, 1 Timothy 1, 15, Romans 6, 23, Romans 10, 9. And that night I realized two things. I believed I was a guilty sinner before God and that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. When I told my wife I was saved, she said, good, you needed it. She had always been a good girl and never did anything that I had done in the past. However, a few months later, she saw that she needed to be saved also and trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. Since then, our lives have been affected by many trials like cancer, death of loved ones, financial difficulties, and so on. And being saved did not prevent uh, us being our lives, uh, all these things happening to us in life. But having God in our lives makes all the difference. Now, there's so much more I could tell you, but I'm restricted to these few short paragraphs. After all, the story is not about me. It's about what God has done for me and what he wants to do for you if you let him. Well, he'll do that for you. This Christmas season, if you confess your sins, you will be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. That means he keeps his promise and just. It means all the books are balanced properly to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then your heart, too, can be clean. Lord, I pray you will use this message this morning to touch the hearts of those whose hearts are full of sin and wickedness and evil. And maybe they're battling with guilt over the things they've done, knowing they've transgressed your laws. Help them to know that Jesus came as the Lamb of God to be sacrificed on Calvary's cross for our sins in our place as our substitute to die so we could be forgiven. And I pray that they will take that step this morning of receiving Jesus into their hearts and lives. And this morning, if you have not yet taken that step of asking Jesus into your heart, would you do that? Would you open the door of your heart? Would you invite him to come in? Just come to him in prayer and say, Dear Lord, I admit I've sinned. I feel the guilt of my sin. Please forgive me for my sins through the shed blood of your son, Jesus. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Become my Savior. And if you pray that prayer and sincerely mean it, Jesus will forgive you your sin. You will know the joy of a cleansed heart. Lord, bless this message. May your name be honored and glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now a song by Hillsong Worship, When I Think Upon Christmas.
Thank you for tuning in to our service. I trust that God blessed you with uh, the realization that uh, Mary had a little lamb that takes away the sins of the whole world. And now the benediction. I want to conclude with a, uh, another uh, recital of that Christmas story. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day.